Hello Mishpacha and welcome back to A Small Sanctuary and I am here to introduce my new series on Shabbat. We have journeyed through all the major holidays together and even some of the minor holidays and the one holiday which is the most important holiday in the Jewish tradition we haven't discussed yet and that is Shabbat. So to round out this whole cycle of the year that I've been journeying through with all of you is Shabbat. Now Shabbat is truly considered the most sacred day of the year, the most special and unique holiday, even though it comes around every seven days, which is great because it means we get a chance to experience it over and over and over again. Now there is a lot of Shabbat content already out there. How to keep Shabbat, what to do with Shabbat, what not to do with Shabbat, the halakha of Shabbat, Jewish law, customs, traditions, traditions for families. So I wanted to do something a little bit different. What I wanted to give to you today is an overarching philosophical framework that will help you make Shabbat decisions that are meaningful to you. Now a question might be, is this a video that takes halakha into account or that is post halachic? And the answer is a little bit of both. It really depends on where you want to take that conversation. And that is between you and the community you are part of, and of course the dictates of your own conscience. The three principles I want to give you <laughs> are all based in everyday objects. The gear, the cup, and the bubble. Now, what do I mean by that? I think you can capture Shabbat by holding the gear filling the cup and growing the bubble. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. Why am I drawing on these three principles? I want to create something that is fresh and radical, but that is at once rooted in our eternal experience of Shabbat. Shabbat really is an echo across time. Its message, as ancient as it is, is still as relevant as ever today. And hopefully, this idea of halting the gear, filling the cup and growing the bubble will help you think through the deeper meanings of Shabbat. So let's talk about the gear. What comes to mind when you think of a gear? A gear is either part of clockwork or part of machinery. And I love the ambiguity because I'm intending it for it to be both. We are stopping the clock, the clock on time and the demands that time plays on us, but we're also halting the machinery of industry on Shabbat. And you know, I really can't emphasize enough what a radical idea Shabbat really is. Radical both in its rootedness and in its willingness to question and challenge power. This idea of stoppage or halting is already inherent in the word Shabbat. Lishvat from which the word Shabbat is derived, means to stop or to halt. In modern Hebrew, shvita is the Hebrew word for strike, as in a stoppage of labor. I want to focus on what it means to halt the gears, both the clockwork and the machinery in our lives and of our lives. I think Shabbat has a radical message of rest, recovery, restitution, and restoration. What do I mean by that? Rest is for pausing. Recovery is for healing. Restitution is for compensating or reclaiming our lost time. And restoration is coming back to our truest selves. These cumulative principles can really help us think through what we want to achieve with our Shabbat and how important this idea of rest and stopping actually is, especially in our go, go, go 24 hour economy. The Torah identifies three categories of labor, Melacha, Avodah, and Avodah Kasha. Let's start 
with the last one first. Avodakasha is slavery. It literally means hard work. This is the work that we are compelled to do by the power that others have over us. And I'm sure we can all think of Avodakasha in our own lives and in the reality that we live in our economy today. The second one, Avoda, means service. It is work, but it can be seen as holy work. It is also the Jewish word for worship. So it can mean service, as in serving others, as well as serving God. And then the third one is melacha, which means creative or productive labor, i.e. the work that creates something new or that produces something in the world. And on Shabbat, we are meant to rest from the first and the third, from Avodah Kasha, from which we hope to be liberated, but also from melacha, productive labor. If we set these things aside, if we stop these things, and what we are left with is the imperative of rest. And this can help us with our decision making around Shabbat. Our second principle is that of the cup. And I want to link that to l'iskor v'lishmor, to remember and to keep. These are two variants of the Ten Commandments that appear in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Zachor et yom ha-shabbat le-kodsho, v'zachor et yom ha-shabbat le-kodsho. You shall remember the Sabbath day and sanctify, and you shall guard or keep the Sabbath day. What does that refer to? Now, a lot of us are familiar with this teaching because it is the reason why we have two Shabbat candles. One for Zachor, for remembrance, and one for Shamor, for keeping. We fill our cup through remembering and keeping the holy day. Now, why the cup analogy? Well, let me show it to you. The cup is the vessel, and the vessel represents keva, structure or fixedness. But the liquid represents kavana, or intentionality. If we only have the vessel, but we don't fill it up, it is empty. But if we only have the liquid and no vessel to contain it, we have nothing to hold it at all. The situation that we want to create with Shabbat is a vessel in which sacred intention is poured. Just so, so that the vessel is the carrier for the holiness and the beauty that we bring to it. But in order for the vessel to be able to do that, it needs structural integrity. It's a very lovely oolong. This is made by the Republic of Tea, a very good tea company, and I can highly recommend them. This is not a commission. Now, everyone's structure may be a little different. For people who are in the halachic community, that structure may very well be determined by halacha. For people in the post or non halachic community, that structure might be informed by the creative process of discernment in terms of the rules and conditions they want to set for themselves. Either way, the structure needs constancy, not necessarily consistency, because we're not always consistent that's okay that's being human after all but it does need constancy something that you return to and again and again and again no matter how far you stray from it in order to create a constancy you need a game plan what is the structure that you are going to pour your shabbat intentions in and however we define intention it's not just a loosey goosey vaguely spiritual feeling there's real thoughtfulness and creativity at the base of it. And those two qualities keep each other in check. A vessel that is empty can become restrictive or even uninspired or constraining. But what good are intentions if we can't bring them to fruition? The third principle I want to talk to you about is that of the bubble. Growing your bubble. I would term this with lekadesh, to sanctify. There are a number of occasions during our Shabbat liturgy, whether it's during Kiddush or in the Apidah that we pray or other blessings that we say, 
ברוך אתה אדוני מקדש השבת. Blessed is the one who sanctifies Shabbat. And this sanctification is really crucial to taking your Shabbat practice to the next level and continuing to grow it. The bubble is all about setting things apart, setting time apart. Now, why did I choose a bubble for this? When I encourage people to take on a Shabbat practice, I talk to them about the constraints of their lived experience. They might have work commitments or family commitments or, or other constraints. And it can seem very overwhelming to take everything on all at once. And we certainly don't want that. Every aspect of Jewish observance is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's something that you grow over time. But it's also okay to set the limitations of your growth to meet the conditions where you're at. And then, once you've established that, to seek to grow yourself a little further each time. The bubble is a good metaphor. Because even if you can only do Shabbat for an hour, then that is your sacred bubble. It might only be Shabbat dinner after you've lit your candles. Or, if you want to grow your bubble a little bit, it may be your whole Friday night. Or, if you want to grow your bubble a little bit more, it might be Friday night and Saturday morning when you go to synagogue or you have a home-based spiritual practice. Or, it could even be the whole day. Whatever it is, think of this bubble as something that has boundaries, but that is also quite flexible and willing to have new breath blown into it. You can also shrink your bubble. It is much better to shrink your bubble than to burst it. If you need a smaller bubble because something is changing in your life, then that's your prerogative. Shrink your bubble to meet the circumstances of your life because Shabbat comes around every week and there might be a future occasion where you can grow your bubble again. Now, here are some practical tips on how to navigate the gear, the cup, and the bubble. Gear. Here are some suggestions. Negotiate time off from work as much as economically feasible for you. And that doesn't mean that you should impoverish yourself on account of keeping Shabbat or miss real economic opportunities that your family may need. But if you can, start by slowly, slowly enacting some boundaries. If not weekly, then a set period of time once a month, once every two months, whatever you can manage. That is about saying to yourself, it is okay to stop. Also think about how you want to engage with the money economy. Traditionally, there's a prohibition on spending money on Shabbat. And here are some guidelines on how to negotiate that. Do not engage altogether with money. That is a possibility. That is how I practice. But there's also a staggered approach. If you are going to engage with the economy, then be intentional how you do it. Things for you to consider. When you are spending money on Shabbat, is it acquisitional, commercial, recreational, or relational? So acquisitional. Are you purchasing something that you really, really want? Can you delay it? You don't need to press that button on your electronic shopping cart. Do you really need to go to the store for something that is not immediately linked to a survival need? Think about how you spend your money. And if you would buy something on Shabbat that retains its existence after Shabbat. So not an experience or such, but a new item of clothing or jewelry or a book. It's an acquisition, and our acquisitions very easily possess us. One down from that is commercial. It might not be acquisitional, but is it really necessary? Like, do you have to go to a pop concert on Shabbat? These are not tangible things that you will keep, but you might want to think about what kind of priorities you set for spending your money. The third one is recreational, and granted, this blurs a little bit. It's going to a national park and taking a hike on Shabbat, but you have to pay an entrance ticket, for instance. You know, 
from a certain non-halachic perspective, that might be very justifiable and defensible. But one type of recreational activity is not necessarily like the other type. So think through what the spirit of Shabbat can inhabit. And then the last one, which I think is most justifiable, is the relational one. Are you going out to lunch with your friends? Are you using money to do some good in the world? Are you giving money to a person who is unhoused and requires money? How that money impacts your human relationships might be a consideration if you do want to partake in a money economy on Shabbat. Also, determine your relationship with electronics. And trust me, this is something I really struggle with. Before the pandemic, I stayed off electronics on Shabbat. And the pandemic has really changed that. And I would like to change back. How much electronics do you want to invite? For strictly halachically observing people, they don't engage with electricity at all, or very limited forms of electricity. Maybe only switching on certain types of lights, for instance. But even for those of us who use electricity, you might still discern what's the difference between electricity and electronics, and what kinds of electronics. Is it okay to use electronics to video conference or video call your family members who are far away from you? How's that different from being on Instagram or doom scrolling through social media, or worse yet, reading the newspaper with all the depressing news? All this can mean very different things for very different people. So there are no easy answers. But thinking about your mental well being, the space that electronics takes up in our lives, and how you can get back to the spirit of Shabbat may help you make some of those decisions. Another practical tip is to think about burdensome activities. Technically, according to Halakha, if you are within the private domain, you are allowed to schlep a heavy sofa from one end of the room to another. It doesn't break the Halakha of Shabbat. Hmm, is it in the spirit of Shabbat though? Something we call Shavuot? I don't know. But there are many burdensome tasks that aren't particularly laborious, but they take us out of the frame of Shabbat like washing the dishes, taking out the trash. Does it really need doing? Is it something that irks you? Then try stopping from that. The last one is to sleep, nap, shluf, rest. There is no greater gift than the Shabbos shluf, the Shabbat nap. That one is pretty self-explanatory. Really use that time to do something that for most adults is a luxury sleep during the day and refresh your soul as the book of Genesis describes it. Now let's talk about the practicalities of the second principle, the cup. How do you fill your cup? What are the positive and affirmative rituals for Shabbat that you create in your own home? It might be the basics like candle lighting and Kiddush and Motzi, blessing the Chala, blessing your children saying Berkat Hamazon, singing Zmirot or Shabbat songs at the table, going to services, all of that traditional stuff. But there are other things too. Is there a special item of clothing that makes you feel beautiful that you wear on Shabbat? Is there a special type of food that you really enjoy and savor for Shabbat? Is there a special activity, a neighborhood walk or something else that brings you joy on Shabbat. This is the time not for the law ta'asez, not for the stops or the don'ts, but for the ta'asez, for the do's. What are you going to do to fill your cup with that sacred intention? This is really where the oneg of oneg Shabbat comes in. Oneg is the Hebrew word for delight. What delights you on Shabbat? It might be relationships with others, intimate relationships, including intimate physical relationships with your spouse. It might be the foods you eat. It might be how you prepare your house, a bouquet of fresh flowers, some beautiful candles, or some beautiful music that you put on, or music that you play, or a particular book that you read, or favorite magazine that feels lovely and indulgent. Think through those aspects of your practice too. Filling your cup is also about relationality. 
as we would say in Hebrew, Ben Adam Lechavro, Ben Adam Lemakom, Ben Adam Laatzmo, meaning the relationships you have with others, the relationships you have with the divine, and the relationship that you have with yourself. This is both the time for external relationships, community, family, friendship, and internal relationships. Some practical tips for the last principle, the bubble. I mentioned it a little bit already, but set your timings apart. Even if it's just for an hour, what does Shabbat lasting an hour look like to you? Is it a 15 minute power nap? Is it a nice cup of tea? Is it a lovely dinner? Maybe it's even a takeout dinner because you're too tired to cook. Whatever it is, grow that bubble from an hour to a little longer, to a little longer, to a little longer, whatever you are capable of. Set yourself some goals for Shabbat growth. Don't remain stagnant in your practice. How can we grow our bubbles and deepen our bubbles and deepen our dwelling inside those bubbles as well? Make a little bit of an effort to plan your Shabbatot. Planning and prepping is half the battle, or maybe even more than half the battle. Are there Shabbatot that you can do in community with friends, family, your synagogue community, whatever community you gather around you? A retreat, maybe once a year or once every couple of years. Keep on developing, striving and growing that beautiful iridescent bubble. And lastly, find contentment in your bubble. The bubble closes you off from the world and within it you can find Shabbat peace. Conclusion. What are some of our concluding thoughts? Question for you. If Shabbat were invented today, what would we restrict and what would we emphasize? What are the things that we would prohibit nowadays if we would draft Shabbat rules for the 21st century? Also, remember that Shabbat was given to the Jews. The Jews were not given to the Shabbat, i.e. the Shabbat should not be yet another enslavement to us. It should be something that liberates us, that brings us joy and that centers us. What are your ways of doing that? Shabbat is every week. Unlike the high holidays or Sukkot or Pesach, it's a pretty low stakes holiday because of that. You didn't make Shabbat this week, you can make it next week. It still counts. So think about that cumulative process of building Shabbat after Shabbat after Shabbat, even if you miss one occasionally. Shabbat has built into itself to Shuvah, a practice of return and opportunities for Tikkun, for healing and for growth. How are you letting yourself be grown by Shabbat? See Shabbat as a gift, as a blessing, and as a delight. A gift because it was given to us by a loving God, a loving universe, the unfolding of our human consciousness, the bending of the cosmic arc towards justice. It is a gift for us to cherish and enjoy. It is a blessing. There's a sacred element to Shabbat. And sanctity doesn't only need to be theistic or religious, it can also be secular. But setting it apart is the sanctity of Shabbat. How are you being a blessing to yourself and to others on Shabbat? And Shabbat is a delight. It is a sensual time, a time for relishing and enjoying and tasting and hearing and seeing and indulging all of our senses. How do you share the gift of Shabbat with others? Who sits at your sacred table? Who dwells in your mikdash me'at, in your small sanctuary? And Shabbat is world transformational. Engaging in Shabbat is redemptive, justice-centered and messianic. Shabbat is called 1 60th of the world to come or 1 60th of the messianic era. Shabbat reminds us that whatever the constraints are in our lives, we still retain power and agency to be free human beings 
on our terms, on God's terms, not on the terms of the clockworks and the machines that drive our lives, but on the terms of our own souls. Wishing you many happy Shabbatot ahead of you. Shalom uvracha with peace and blessings from my bite to your bite. Little bonus content. I want to tell you about the necklace I'm wearing today, which I got at Modern Tribe for my birthday a little while ago. And it is made by an independent artist and I will link her name and her details both in the video and in the show notes. It is a mini gala. I couldn't imagine a more perfect thing to wear for Shabbat. Bye.